Well, it's good to see you, Pavinia. I hadn't seen you in a while. I'm glad you made it. Hope you're feeling better. We have a lot of people. Good to see everybody this morning. If you join us online, we're really honored to have you join us. We, if you have any questions, we hope that you would reach out to us, send us an email, and ask us questions about our faith so that we can share what excites us about our Lord and Savior. You know, last week I kind of touched on this, and it kind of sent me down this path of the idea of what do we see. Remember last week I talked about you know, how we look at things and how we already have uh, some ideas and preconceived notions about things. We see certain type of people, we automatically think. So if I just describe you a picture of, of a guy sitting on a motorcycle that had these handlebars up like this, you automatically have a picture, and I bet you your picture is a little bit different from mine, but you have an idea and you have a feeling about how comfortable are you with that. Or if you're to see some mafia guy, you know, or gangster or something like that, or you see a, a guy with a scraggly beard. We had a man that used to worship here, a lot still remember him, Alan Pumphrey. And he worked for the city. He was the parks manager. Parks manager for the city. But he would go down to Animas, New Mexico, in the boot hill country, and he would cowboy. I mean, he would cowboy hard. He would come back filthy, smelling, gruffy beard. And one time he was in Albertsons, and he said he was walking in, and the guy walked up to him and said, Get a job! And he looked at him, and he goes, I have one, thank you. And he walked on. And that's what I mean. You know, so we, we have this this view based on our experiences that we grow up with and cultures and things. And there's some cultures that we're probably more comfortable with than we would uh, go to Vietnam. You know, go, go there. I showed pictures of two congregations, one from the Philippines and one from America. And I had you kind of look at the two of those and say, okay, which one would you be more comfortable with? And that's our vision. That's what we see. And one of the points about that lesson is that God wants us to see souls. See the way God sees them. Not the way we do. Because we see people wrapped around with what we believe and what we're comfortable with. And God doesn't. And, but that requires a little more depth, doesn't it? And as Christians, how did you do last year when it comes to that? You know, and it's even, it's even gone to other levels, you know, when it comes to different behaviors socially in our country. When we look at people who don't wear a mask and walk into a store, what do you think? Does it upset you? Are you okay with that? Or did you just miss the fact that this person needs the gospel? That maybe they need Jesus in their life? Do we stop there because we're not having the same vision that God has? And that's an individual level that I talked about last week. This week I want to talk about us as a group of Christians because that's the pattern we find in the New Testament. We find that local groups, you know, sporadically throughout Asia, in Judea, in Rome, Italy, and spreading all the way up to, we find documentation of churches in England far as England, that's what's amazing to me that we forget that how much the Word of God got around and moved. But they worked together. And they had a lot of problems, didn't they? Because we know, we look at the letters, we see the Ephesians, we, we see Ephesus, we see Corinth, we see them. And God would have to remind them. Then we see where Jesus, even himself, through the Apostle John, wrote a letter to each of the seven churches of Asia. Now, these men were still, these churches were still being guided by people who had the inspired Holy Spirit within them. They didn't just have Bibles at their church building, Bibles at their home, Bibles on their PDAs. No, they had the assembly, they came together. They didn't have the same, they had, but they had men who were inspired directly by God that was teaching them every Sunday or every time they'd come together as well. And so you could trust that that person who was standing before you, whether it was Paul, Apollos, or whoever it might be, was speaking for God. And in that scenario, we find they were still messing up. God was still having to kind of course correct them, wasn't he? And of all those seven churches, it's interesting, there's really only one of those seven that was actually in error of doctrine. The rest of them, one of the greatest things he lays on them is 
You left your first love. What does that mean? Wait a minute, we're doing everything doctrinally right. We, we, we come to church, we're doing everything, we contribute, we, we partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. How can I not love you, but yet I'm doing these things? You lost your love. You lost your motivation. Do you think just coming to church is pleasing God? And that's what he talks about. Six out of the seven, think about that for a moment. Only one of them was not following Scripture. And he gives the ones, the six, he goes, I will take my fellowship away from you. Hence, called the candlestick, right? And I often think, where would we fall? What would our letter be? And there's parts I don't know that I want to receive that letter. Because I know that I'm just as responsible. I can't stand up here and make myself feel like, well, I'm better than you at all. <laughs> you know, I've always say, if you've seen any of my emails, you're either a part of the solution or a part of the problem. We're all in it together. But we have to be able to have not only individual vision, to look and see souls that are lost, have the love that God has, that he has for all people, regardless of who they are, what culture, what they're dressed, like all people. And if we don't have that, then just stop. Because the rest of this lesson won't mean anything. Because it doesn't matter how many people we have. We can have 10,000 people. But if they don't love souls the way God does, you'll fail. We just fail. So that's why last week's was so imperative for you to understand and to get and hopefully motivate you to review the way you see people. No matter how angry they make you. No matter how they cut you off. Please, don't let that stop you from valuing their souls the way God does. Because then we will fail as a collective group of Christians. But we have to once a year. We need to stop and look. We need to evaluate. We do that usually on New Year's Eve. People, you know, on the New Year's Eve, ringing out the old, bringing in the new. I saw all sorts of memes talking about how terrible last year was and terrible the year before. And, oh boy, here we go again. And, you know, and, but, what, but the point is we stop, don't we? And we assess. And I know this is a good time of the year because you probably, hopefully, I think you might have done that. The news sure did it for us, didn't it? It brings up the past. It talks about it. And good, bad, or indifferent. It, that's the time of the year. Why? Who cares? Why is that? You know, have you ever thought about that? Why don't we just have a party and say, call it a new calendar day? Why is it that it causes us and all people to sit and go, well, what did I do? What did, we, what did we accomplish? What happened last year? Because we don't want to believe that it had no value. And we want to believe that we have a mission and a purpose and a direction in which we're going, individually, collectively, as a nation, whatever it is. You know why? What else? What it is, if we don't? It's called chaos. Chaos. It's, you know, it's just, you've got to have it. And that's why this, this scripture here from the Proverbs 29.18 Talking about, you know, with no vision, people perish. And then look at the last part of that. He says, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. So how do we stop from perishing is one, we need to keep the law. Now that sounds really legalistic, doesn't it? Very difficult. John says that God, Christ's laws are not burdensome. They're not things in which we look at him that way. A criminal looks at things as law, and you say it to them, and they go, whoa, restrictive, man. I can't steal. I can't cheat. I can't. And it bothers them. But how many of you this morning got up and really had to hold yourself back from wanting to murder somebody and shoot him? Did you really have to think about it? If you did, you might talk to a counselor. But normally we don't. Now, I bet you coming in, you might have thought about your speed limit a little bit. It's kind of restrictive, isn't it? It tells you. But aren't you a whole lot happier if you follow the law and the speed limit? I, once I learned that, even traveling like the Texas, I used to think that was just, who cares? A suggestive speed limit? I wanted to get there in two hours if it's a 10-hour trip. And I would set it as fast as I could go. And man, you know what? I had nerves. <laughs> could I, and all of a sudden, you'd see everybody tapping their brakes, tapping their brakes, tapping their brakes, right? Now, did you know, I don't know if you travel lately, but Google will actually tell you there's a speed trap if you're doing one of the, the navigation things. And it'll ask you, is the speed trap still there? 
Why do we use those things? Because we want to break the bounds, don't we? But while we're driving it, we're, we're intense. We're, we're, there's this nervousness about it. But when I just gave up and said, you know, I'm just going to set it at the speed limit, man. It was a much more pleasant trip. And I didn't get there much faster or slower either. That's a happy person because you're following the law. You start breaking the law. And that's, now we're talking about God's law here. We follow what God's directives are and what he's trying to help us to do is because he wants us to be happy. And there has to be a standard. There has to be a moral standard. We understand that. You stand in a line and somebody cuts you off. You get mad. What right do you have? It's not fair. It's in us. So if we want to be happy, he says, follow after that. But vision, when it comes to us as Christian, comes from knowledge of God's Word. You can't see something you haven't heard about, you don't know about. You know, I, I imagine somebody like driving down the road and you know, got this really clear windshield. Now I want you to look at this picture, by the way. What's wrong with this picture? I'll give you a moment. Okay, tell me what you think is wrong with that picture. Because there's something really glaring that's wrong with this picture. But can you imagine, you know, you've had that, and I just came back from Texas, and there's a lot of bugs on there, and it's amazing how slowly those bugs pile up. And slowly you can't see as clear. You had a windshield, you know, you can't see out of it. How long would you go if you had a drive where you had something like that blocking your view where you couldn't see in front of you? You'd stop and maybe even wash it. I've had to do that. Been out four wheeling one time. We got mud all over the windshield, and I had to stop and get water and pour it on it. I couldn't. I would not go any further because I knew it wasn't safe. How about spiritually? Do you know where you're going? Do we have a vision? What have we accomplished? You know, in order to have a future vision, though, we have to have the ability to look back. Because that's the only place you have. That is what they call the baseline. That is what you have done. Concretely, it's already sealed. So you should be able to look at what you've done, good, bad, and most of us are probably very critical of ourselves, and we look at it spiritually anyway and go, man, I haven't accomplished anything. And then some, maybe they didn't even think about it. But I bet you, I know last year, I gave a very exact, very similar sermon about looking back and having vision and giving you some goals. Do you remember that sermon at all? I'll be honest with you, I don't remember it either. But I know I have it on there. I looked at it. But did you look back? Do we look back and honestly say, okay, this is where I was. This is where, and we've been doing this for how many years now? Since I've been preaching. Every first of the year, I try to bring one consistent sermon about vision planning, establishing goals, measuring them. Every healthy organization, and I know the church is not the same, but there's some very, very, very important principles there that are applicable to us. They self-evaluate. They reset themselves. They look at what they've done. They course correct, but they have to have a baseline. We have to look in the past. So it means we have to be able to look back and see what we've done. So what have we accomplished as a church here this last year? Anybody know? Now, some of that could be the failure that, you know, the elders, we haven't communicated it. And that's, that's, a, that, that's, just, that's legitimate because that's a part of a good organization is communication from those who are leading you, who are, you know, helping to guide that direction. But I know that it has gone out. One thing I've tried to do is to share that information and get it out. You need to know. You say you're a part of the family. And it should excite you, motivate you, and do something to you when you saw that information coming to you. And I don't know how it is, and I don't know. Some emails get bounced back. I don't know if I have all your emails. I try. But I try to do that because I want you to understand you're a part of this local group of Christians. A critical part of this whether you understand it or not. And we love you, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't matter. We love you. And I love you. I may not like what you're doing or how you're not acting or interacting with the church and stuff, but you know what? It's, I love you. I know we're not perfect. 
But we have to get better. Every one of us. Every one of us. Nobody accomplishes it in one. So in 2021, we look back. I, I start with we have to understand what was our goal to begin with. And it's something else that we had put out. Very simple. I mean, I think we all understand Matthew 28, 19 and 20, I think, really cinches what our mission statement is as an organization, if you want to kind of call it that. I don't like doing that, but that's what we would say. It's this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There it is. There it is. You know, that, I've seen organizations pay a consultant thousands and thousands of dollars to come in and to develop them a mission state. When I was working at Memorial Medical Center, I was on one of those committees, and they brought this high-paid, you know, team from Chicago. And we spent, like, I don't know how many meetings coming together trying to come up with this vision statement and all this stuff and rewording it and, you know, to where it meant something. And I remember back then going, man, Christians, we got it made. Our, we got ours. It's, what is it? simple. Make disciples and teach disciples everything that Jesus has commanded and taught. And one of the ways that it's also included, it's not stopping at the Gospels because we know that Jesus, when he told his disciples that when I depart, you're going to receive a helper. That helper is going to help you bring forward all the memory in which I, you have experienced with me. And the Holy Spirit is also going to advocate for me to you. And I will reveal everything my Father wants from me down to the Holy Spirit. And what they speak, you will know it's coming from me. Putting it in, kind of wrapping it up and succinctly saying it, but that's what he said. So whatever you're going to speak, it's me through you. So that means now we look at the Gospels. We look at beyond the Gospels. We can look at the letters that were written. We can look in the book of Acts. We can see things and know exactly what they were. So there's a lot more than just saying simply, you know, make disciples because those disciples have to be trained. They have to be edified and built up. And so it leads to the next greatest one. So two, kind of three, I guess. Make disciples, edify those, teach them. And the third one is love one another. Do you know that's the hardest one? Remember what I started with, talking about how we look at people. If you don't love them, you won't see a soul that needs to be saved. And if we're struggling to love like God loves, then how are we able to love one another the way God loves one another? And we, he wants us to. Jesus said, I command, this is a command, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's what I want you to do for everyone. How did he love them? How has God demonstrated that love? And that's what we have to think about personally and think, how have I loved my brother and sister in Christ last year? What did I do for them? And I know that hurts for me too. But honestly, if we were to get that letter from Jesus, what would it say? Six out of seven, the response was, you fell out of love with me. Six out of seven churches, he blasted them because they fell out of love. So that's why, because like I said, six out of seven were doctrinally correct. They were teaching the right doctrine. They were worshiping the right way, but they did not love. So that's why I say this one is the hardest. And I think it's even harder today because of all that's going on, the isolation and separation and the restrictions that we have makes it more difficult. But I think of rescuers sometimes, you know, somebody who walks up and sees somebody in peril and they don't care about their own health. They'll jump out. They'll jump in and they'll risk it. Now, I'm not saying go risk yourself when it comes to, you know, the virus and being protected. But is it holding you back as well? Does isolation and separation say that we give up on our requirement to love one another and serve one another? Do we forsake that? You think we're going to be able to stand before God and say, well, I had to wear a mask and stay six feet apart and I couldn't be with one another? I couldn't help one another? I don't think so. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be safe. I, 
I'm saying we need to be careful that we're not using it as a fear factor to stop us from doing what we should be doing as Christians. Because the mask is not going to go with us in eternity. There's no masking in heaven. There's no isolation. It's, it's not the fear. And if it's not this, it's always been something. And it'll always be something. That's just the way life is. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. That's the way life is. It really is. So it's a great lesson to think about. Be safe. Wear your mask. I mean, do it. That's fine. But how do you view people? And are you willing to let that stop you? Because you can do it safely. We can assemble safely. But I want us to think about that. So what did we accomplish last year? <clears throat> a lot. We really did. And so I want to share a few things. I'm not going to give you a detailed report. But when we talk about where we were two years ago, you know, we were just starting out, you know, January, remember? We are just starting out to get that impact of the virus coming out, and we're starting to get it. And then all of a sudden, by March uh, 2020, we, we couldn't meet. It started getting to that point where we were really, you know, having to isolate and break apart. And then it really started hit us. And we started basically trying to reach out and get connected, back connected with everybody using Zoom and technologies that we did not have in place. We had a lot of things that were really helping us, but was not there. And it was hard. It was difficult, but we did it. And then last year, we not only expanded upon just reaching out with one another so that we could have some of our own members, but now the Word of God coming from this local group of Christians is all around the world. Think about that. I remember, you know, growing up, we'd go to the bulletin board or somebody making the announcement would come and say, oh, yeah, well, we got a report from a missionary in, Philipp in Phil the Philippines or Mexico or somewhere like that. It's like, yeah, look, we're, we're, we've got people we're sending money to and going out. And I'm not saying stop doing that either, by the way. But without leaving the building, right now, this is going around the world on the ether. And that was an impact that when I started looking at the numbers viewed, the hours, right now of all the videos we have, we're getting about 25 views on those videos. 25. And I think about before we even had any of this, we never had 25 visitors come here. Now, some of those are you, I understand that. But over 500 hours a month are being watched. That's amazing. So we have, we've expanded. And not just with you know, some out-of-focus camera. Good quality where people could come and learn. And integrate all of this technology has been one of the things of one of the biggest heartaches, but greatest things that we've done. Now, it's a quick system. I can upload. We've got a podcast. It's, that podcast is now integrated into the Facebook automatically. The sermon or Bible study, I have an audio. I just click, grab that file, throw it into that software program, and boom. And it automatically then integrates to Facebook now. It integrates and uploads the lesson over to our, our web page and anybody who would subscribe to it. And they're there. That is such a powerful tool for you to see when you see a lesson and you think of somebody that, hey, this lesson could be something good. Share, like, and share. You know that term, like and share. So now it's moved out where it's not just the preacher or just the elders or just a collect little few that can do this. The power now is in all of the members of doing this. That's what I think is awesome about that accomplishment, what we've done. We've had two baptisms last year. That's, and I know it's not well, only two, but you know what? Years passed, and a lot of it is because of this. We had a soul that was saved that was not even in this area because of what we were doing on the internet presence. The angels rejoiced with one soul saved. That's the power of it. I don't know what the good number is. I don't know. You know, I mean, the Lord's going to say, well, Ron, you didn't meet your quota each year. You fell short of baptism stuff. I don't think that's the point. I go back to the love. If I don't love God first and try and want to do this, then it doesn't mean a thing. The podcast. On Friday morning, just floundering, kind of, and pulling that together. But you'd be surprised how many people that I'm getting messages from that, that have never, we don't have anything in Las Cruces. They're looking for something like that. Something simple and just, you know, kind of raw. Not a professional production. And that one is going up on the podcast. 
We're live streaming to Sandia Church Facebook page, our Facebook page, and YouTube all at the same time. Phenomenal. It's overwhelming. You know you've lived through a lot of the headaches with us. But I'm not going to quit because I know we're reaching people. We're reaching people. Now, I wish the building would just flood in with people. I wish they could all come in. Some of them we don't know. One person that, that I had no idea where they're from, they're, I'm interacting with them on chat while I'm up here. If you saw that Facebook page of all the computers and technology I'm trying to use and balance and then teach, you know, I had to learn a new skill set. But it's been wonderful. And then watch people interacting, and one I didn't even know, and, and we start chatting offline with emails and stuff, and they live here. So, you know, I mean, that's more than I have been able to interact and reach out as a preacher than I've been here for 20 years. So there's a lot. We have. We really have. Our Facebook, our, our website. Go there. Use it. Videos are being uploaded. They're there too. The podcast, one of the top menu things is podcasts there. Like and share. Share it with people. Use it. Because that's a way we can as well. I'm putting all sorts of apologetic videos, some of the great ones about the one with the dinosaur tissue that they're finding in fossils. Some great things that you could go and enjoy, not just Ron's sermons. Ugh, I couldn't stomach those either. You know, if that's all there was. I mean, great tool for you to help build you up, build your faith and become stronger. So we have to get personal. We have to think about if we're going to go forward, if we have to get individually, and this is just where you're going to have to answer that question for yourself. But I'll give you some scripture that I think that helps to set forward something. It's what Peter said in Second Peter in verse 5 and 7. But this, in this very thing, bring all diligence, filling out your faith with virtue. With virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, self-control. Self-control, patience. With patience, Godliness, with godliness, brotherly kindness, and with brotherly kindness, love. Take that scripture, break it down, and you can see this is a great. Well, 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 the first thing he says, though, is what? Look what he says. In all diligence. That's the thing that I have failed when I have, you know, like New Year's resolutions. I don't stay diligent to it. We ought to stay diligent. Look at the fruit of the Spirit. The things like that that you look at. And uh, self-evaluate. Have you grown? What have you grown? And if you can't honestly answer that question, then that's okay. That's where you're at. That's where you're at right now. No regrets. Don't look at the bass. Done. It's over. But that's what I want you to do. If you can't honestly answer that I'm a better Christian today than I was last year, then that's your baseline. Let's move forward. That's what we have to do. So where do we go from here? You know, once we've established that, we look at what we've done. Well, I'll tell you right now, my goal is to continue to outreach and use that opportunity that we have on the uh, social media platform presence and use it. That's one of the things that, you know, when, you, you, when I looked at the parable that Jesus gave about the shrewd servant, about the man who was embezzling from his master, and all of a sudden, the master calls him in because he's going to hold him account for it. And he says, you know, um, you're going to be held accountable because you're, you're embezzling from me. And he leaves and he starts to work. And he's like, you know what? I got to square stuff away. So what does he do? He goes and he calls all the people who have accounts with his master and he settles their debt at half the cost. He didn't get approval. But what did he say when he started that plan? What am I going to do when I don't have this job? I'm, and he admits it, he's honest. He says, I'm too lazy to work. I don't have any skill sets, really. Ah, to secure my future, this is what I will do. And it was risky. Because the master could have had him imprisoned or killed for thieving. And so he cuts a deal with all of them. The statement that his master says is not an endorsement that Jesus is trying to say concerning embezzlement and trying to cover it up and make a deal. The guy said, well, if I make these deals, then when I'm thrown out and bounce out on the street, these guys will have to take me in because I did such a good job for cutting their debt that they'll take care of me. So I'll have my future invested. The master said, whoa, that is amazing. 
Now, we don't know if he went ahead and threw him out or fired him, but he said, that to me is shrewd. That is taking care of yourself and looking at the future. Now you say, well, there's no good in that parable. And Jesus says, you know what? I wish that the sons of men, in other words, Christians, let's call it, were as concerned about their future as the world is. That they would put as much effort and energy in to spending eternity somewhere that they will do what they need to do to take care of their future. Because that's where it's at. And there's a, there's a strong parallel because, you know what, we're all embezzling, we're all criminals before God and His law. And he's not saying do something corrupt, but the point was the effort in which this man, and which people in the world will go to to secure a retirement and be safe. He goes, I wish, this is Jesus, I wish that the children of God would do that same thing. And so there are things that are outside our comfort zone, things that we have to do, that we have to think about and try to work. But it takes some courage, doesn't it? Because we're going to have to make some adjustments. You're going to have to evaluate yourself. You're going to have to come up with your own personal plan. I don't want to do that for you. If you have something you want me to help me study with you, okay. Make me a part of your plan, but I'm not going to be making your plan. Because that's something we have to do personally. And it does take courage to change. It takes, I think, more courage to first look back and evaluate and assess and go, I am wrong, I did wrong, I need to fix something. And then desire and love God enough to say, I'm going to do what I need to do. To secure salvation. We want salvation, right? Nod your head, yeah. We got to love God with all our heart. But like James says, faith without action is dead, like the body without the spirit. You can have faith all day long, but if you're not doing something about it, then he compares it to James. He goes, well, you know what? Even the demons have faith and they, they tremble. So do we have some people that sometimes just come to church and they tremble, but they don't do anything? Then you know the connection, right? Then what are we any better than the the demons who say they believe and they tremble and they show respect to God? And we come to church and we show respect to God, but we don't do anything. And that's what James says. Faith without doing something is absolutely dead. So it's going to take courage to get us out of that. Because this is what... Peter said, we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. That's where you used to live. We are now into that marvelous light. Everything that we're doing should be proclaiming the beauty of Christ and the love that he has for us. But it's going to require some suffering as well. It's going to require some hard, you know, uncomfortableness. (laughs) And, oh, the Lord knows I've had some terrible times. <laughs> I was talking to one preacher and I told him, I said, man, you know, for the days that I could just stand up there with just a hard paperback Bible and just preach from that with nothing, maybe even candles, no technology. And that, you know what, but that's not our society, is it? And so I'm going to use the abilities that we have around us and the access and those things in which the world is using, like As much as I don't like Facebook, there's so many bad things about it, but that's a tool I'm going to use to secure it. And I had to learn it, and I'm still learning it. If you you saw our Facebook page, I had to to delete one. We're re-adding another one because I set it up all wrong. I I am not. Too many things. But I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to let down. Because I know we're getting the right message out. We're getting the gospel out to people. And so I'm going to use whatever resource we can in a very godly way to reach people so they can get an opportunity to hear the gospel. And it's not comfortable. It's embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. And it's scary to sit up there while you're live streaming and somebody chats and says, well, what does verse 14 mean? And I'm sitting there going, I don't remember 14. Where were we? Uh, Do I acknowledge that they even said anything? And I'm like... Okay, let's look at 14. And I don't know what their motivation is. Are they setting me up or something, you know, that they're going to drop on me? Or, you know, it's like very uncomfortable. It's so nice when I had a little podium and I just sit there on a little stool and I knew everybody was sitting there and we said, let's go to James and let's study, right? Much more comfortable. Not comfortable at all with what we're doing now for me. 
It's been very hard, very lonely. So I know, but we're being successful. So I know. I can feel you. I know it's not going to be easy. But I think about Moses. Now, Moses, he knew he was born a Hebrew, but then he was raised in the house of Pharaoh with riches, with an abundance of things that he could have had. Pharaoh could have been on his way to actually be a Pharaoh himself because he was the son, the grandson of the Pharaoh, the grandson of the Pharaoh. He could have been the next king, ruler of Egypt. But there was something in his heart that said, no, I think this is amazing. Look at this. Choosing rather, Hebrews eleven twenty five twenty six. 26. Choosing, this is Moses, rather to be treated with the people, mistreated to be rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure. Look at that, fleeting. The fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. Are you looking forward to the reward? Because if you can't see it, you're not looking forward, then no doubt you're going to have a wasted year again. It's not going to be a good year spiritually for you. Now, anybody pick up on something he, the Hebrew writer says here about Christ? Did Moses know Christ? Wait a minute. We got hundreds of years that Moses lived, and then Christ showed up. You notice he didn't say Jesus. See, there's a concept, an idea of what that Messiah, what that word meant. And that's what he saw. So when you hear that and you read this in Hebrews, I never want you to think that he was thinking about the man Jesus who lived with the apostles and walked on this earth. What he's talking about is one that was going to bring them this great blessing. He would rather pursue that than live in comfort all the days of his life. Are you? It's a hard question. How comfortable are you? Well, compared to who? It doesn't matter. Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort in order to pursue the Christ? Because that's where it really comes out. And the reproaches, you notice he says that? The ridicule. He never had it easy, did he? I mean, oh man. Even when he finally got the people out of Egypt... Trouble after trouble, complaining. Oh, can we go back to Egypt? Wasn't there enough graves there? We want meat. We want water. Blah, 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 blah. You know, just... Man, and he was 80 years old when he started. How old are you? Anybody 80 in here? Nope. I don't think so. If you are, you're looking really good (laughs) for 80. (laughs) Oh, you're right. Sorry. You are looking really good, Mr. Haynes. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> but you get my point you say well I'm too old or I'm too young huh. Joseph let's go that direction right the age is now that's what we see there you know another person that I see that it accomplished he, he didn't just want to understood the pleasures of what he was accomplishing living in but he had accomplished it and was living the dream career. And yet, he said, no. You know what I'm talking about? The Apostle Paul. While he's sitting in Rome, fixing to go before that insane emperor, Nero. That ins- Nero. If there's one emperor name that people know, it's Nero. And he's going to have to stand before Nero. And then he says in another letter, he says, and when I stood before Nero, nobody was with me. All that little buddies that showed up that were going to travel with me and with me, he goes, no, nobody was with me. I had to stand before him by myself. He said, but I wasn't alone. (laughs) He said, for the Lord was with me. So even when you feel like you're alone, when I have my little self-pity parties and I think, oh man, I'm all by myself, I'm doing all this by myself, I remember, no, I am not alone. Because I will always have the Lord with me. But listen to what he says, starting in verse 3, chapter 3, verse 7. Whatever gain I had, 
I counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that depends from God, that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. A couple of things there at the end. Share in the sufferings because of what he accomplished. And the way he says this, you know, I think is powerful because he goes, by any means possible, any way, anything, just like that servant that Jesus was talking about, that he would do anything that was necessary to secure the crown of righteousness. If that means I get beat by my own men, if I get stoned to death and drug out of the city, no matter what happens, because I've got a crown of righteousness awaiting me. That's what we have to have. If we're going to continue to be able to serve and say that we are truly a disciple of Christ. We have to have vision. And that's what we're going to work on. I'm going to come in and I'm going to, we're going to put together so that we can see, you know. And you need to find what are you doing. One, well, first, your own soul. What are you doing to save your soul, keep your soul saved? And what are you doing personally to grow? But the other one then is you need to ask, what are you doing for your brothers? What are you showing love? Is it by not coming to church? Is that really showing love? By staying away? Is that showing love? By not helping out? Is that showing love? Finding out who's hurting, who's suffering, what can we do? And another part of that love is letting people help you. Let people show you their love. Because that takes humility to admit, I need help, doesn't it? that I am not all together, and I'm struggling. And so it's both sides. Because I know some of you are real stubborn about really saying, you know, because you think you got it in control. We don't. We need one another. We need to share one another. Be long-suffering, bearing one another's burden, rejoicing when we rejoice and weep together when we weep. That's what a family is about. That's what we say we are. So how are you doing this morning with your walk with God? Are you with Jesus? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Because that's where it all starts. That's where that relationship starts, and you become a part of that beautiful family. And that's what I cherish the most, is the family that I have here. It's not because it's, we're perfect. It's because you're family, and that's why I will stick here. I will be with you. And I know there's a lot that will be there for me and have been there for me in the years past. And that's what we have to hold to. If you're not a Christian, I plead with you. Take that step to becoming a Christian by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're a Christian and you've fallen away and you need direction, you know, turn to your Heavenly Father and pray to Him. That's where you need to go. Not to a man, but if you, if you want, we can pray with you. We'd love to serve you. It takes a lot of humility. It does. But the most important thing is the crown of righteousness. What are you willing to do to secure that? Jesus wants us to be wise and desire it so much that we will put all of our resources and energy and effort and talents towards it. So think about this while we stand and sing. If we can help you, let us know.